talking about? <laughs> Which last time? I don't know. Anyways, we were talking about these books, the Navigator series, two seven series, and we were discussing growing in Christ and the five basic scriptures. And the five basic scriptures was what I wanted to teach on in a basic Bible class that I was starting called Bible Studied. And we're going to break that up into two different segments. The way we're going to do that is that we're going to stick with the 2-7 series, which is Growing in Christ. Now, Growing in Christ includes the five basic scriptures. But we want to separate those because what Calvary did was we used the five basic scriptures. We didn't do the full onslaught of uh, the Growing in Christ series, which is a 13-week course, which is real formal. And I will, since I've already stuck my neck out, <laughs> as a teacher, <laughs> um, we will go through that in a different set called, I don't know, Bible Discipled. <laughs> you know? And this one will be called Bible Study. Because what I want to do is I want to take these five scriptures because that's the most important thing to me. It's a home Bible study. It's a setting where you can take five weeks, teach yourself how to do a home Bible study to share with your friends have a simple little thing that you could carry around in your pocket and just say, hey, you know what, I'd like to get together and study one of these, you know, and you hand it out and you pass it around, you know, and they can read it and they go, well, that's pretty simple, it's got all the five little scriptures, you know, and they're perforated, you know, so they can take them out, you know, and they can break them up and memorize them, because that's what the point is, is that it's to take you from the very basics, you know, like, say you got saved, you know, if, if I got saved, I'm not going to want to, you know, give them a gospel of John and send them off on their way and hopefully that they're going to figure out what in the beginning was the word and word was with God and word was God means. Because I don't get it, <laughs> you know. And that would have confused the snot out of me. Fortunately, when they sent me home, whatever they sent me home with, I only had a pocket New Testament, so I, I never got really anything to follow up with, you know. And it wasn't their fault necessarily, but I think they were out. But the point is, is that I read Matthew first. That made sense to me. <laughs> then I understood where Jesus came from. You know? Otherwise, it didn't make any sense to me. You know, I was like, by the time I got to John, I was ready for it because I was about the third or fourth time that I'd heard about it. <laughs> by then, I'd already known quite a bit. And it's like, oh, okay, I got it. You know, the word, yeah, I got you. Okay, fine. You know, now we know. But basics are what we're talking about. Going from what we should know to what we need to know immediately before we kind of get off tangent. And that's what this was designed about, designed for. It is a pretty impressive, I believe, um, little packet that when I learned them was the first thing that the Home Bible, Home Pastors class was teaching at Calvary, you know, Costa Mesa at the time. And it was kind of like, you know, passed out and the video, the, the cassette series was usually given out with it. We kind of, you know, gave it out to all the different pastors that were still becoming pastors and wanted to be a home pastor and it was kind of still getting a little organized and it was one of the pre, pre, pre home pastor classes. <laughs> there were a lot of them that kind of started, failed, started, failed. Well, they didn't fail, but they kind of developed into something more formal. So what we want to do is we want to go on with beginning with Christ. And what I wanted to do today is to just simply explain how there's two different home study, you know, series. The other one's going to be called Bible Discipled, you know, which is growing in Christ or growing with Je growing in Jesus. And this is beginning with Jesus, you know. So I hate saying the word Christ, you know, it's kind of like, oh, no, no, no. Well, I could say Messiah and then get every, all the Jews, you know, the Messianic Jews come along, you know, and say, what? Huh? <laughs> you know, wait. But in reality, I want to change it also because it starts with, I think, Oh, I don't know. Assurance of salvation. I want to start with a different one. Is that I want to change it a little bit, even though we're going to read them and we're going to go through them. I want to start with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Because I believe with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength that if there was ever any scripture you were going to memorize, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 will take you through the rest of your life and you will never complete never completely understand all that that entails because it will always be your assurance your reassurance it will always be your disciple it will always be your confirmation of what you should do and what you need to do all the days of your life that's just me you know because assurance of salvation is kind of like you know it's like you know well you know i don't want to assure someone when they're still kind of like you know just got saved you know it's like 
they know they're safe, you know, they're kind of excited, they want to do something now and move on. So the way that I would present this material would be to go immediately to trust in the Lord with all your heart. So when we go through it, if you purchase one of these, if you find them in the Navigator Press, you can find it on the internet, you know, it's a, uh, this one I think was 99 cents or something, you know, but you can find them all over the, all over the place, beginning with Christ, Navigator series, um, Nav Press, if you want to call it that, and um, make copies of it, you know, off the internet. You can download it, and it's on a PDF file, and you can even print it out. But in explaining that, that's why I wanted to make this a let's see, basic Bible, no, Bible disciple, you know, kind of intro, and a Bible studied kind of intro, because. A couple other things we want to talk about are inviting people, you know. Um, in a Bible study, it's really a potluck. I mean, that's what it should be. You should have a place, wherever it is, in the park, in a restaurant, in Denny's, you know, or wherever your favorite place is. You should have some people that you know are going to come that you're not going to get blown out if they don't. Usually it's good to start with one other person, you know, just do it one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, if you have more, great. Um, never have more than, you know, you can handle, meaning that if you're good at, you know, being able to field questions or to discuss things or to, you know, kind of like control things a little bit about in social gatherings, then the maximum I would say would be 12 for one really professional speaker, you know, that could kind of like coordinate things and see how things are going. Um, more than 12 gets unruly. Just blunt truth. It's a fact. Um, optimum would probably be five to seven, you know. It's probably about the best number that you're ever going to deal with because it will get uncontrollable right around that number anyways. And that should you come into conflict, you can easily deal with that, you know, in a lot easier way, you know. And there should be no conflict. These are pretty simple. It should be no problem. But these need to be said out loud. So in a Jewish setting, most discussions are done over food, you know. It's kind of like at the kitchen table, you know, or at the communal table, or at the table that was presented in the midst of my enemies. But no, that was presented as a place of communion. Because communion meant eating physical food and spiritual food. You were meant to consume things while you were talking. Now, I know most of you can't do what I would recommend, so I'm just going to say what I would do. And what I would do is I would set up a whole bunch of food, you know, either in a potluck setting with a bunch of pots, you know, a bunch of bowls and everything, you know, finger foods or, you know, you want to get fancy, get fancy. You know, I've done everything. I mean, I have done, you know, everything from finger foods to full-blown dinners to even uh, informal gatherings and even wine coolers. Did he say wine coolers? <laughs> and... In that, and I've even done Shabbos, you know, where we had it at Friday night, so, you know, we kind of had the Shabbos dinner, you know, and we kind of, like, you know, taught that. But the point is, is that you can do whatever is comfortable for you, you know, is that you want to have a few people that you know, or, or that are you getting to know, and that you're going to go through, you know, at least five weeks with them, you know, because that's how long the five scriptures are. You should have food. So, cover it, you know, plan on it. Think about these things. You're having kind of like a social gathering, so... Have the food, have plates for them, have silverware or, you know, plastic, whatever, don't matter. Have everything ready for anything that comes up. Just in case you need, you know, spills, we'll have a towel on the side, you know. Don't let anything distract or attract attention off of what you're there for. Feeding and fooding and eating is not distracting because you're keeping other people's mouths occupied while you're teaching. That's the way I would do it. See, I would teach while people are eating, and then I would eat afterwards, you know, while people are discussing, I'd be chomping. <laughs> okay, maybe I wouldn't be chomping because I was always answering questions, but eventually, you know, I'd take home the leftovers. Or if it's in your home, you get the leftovers. But I always presented the food, you know. I didn't really go for this potluck thing because people notoriously don't bring food. So offer willingly to provide the food. You know, it's just a simple thing that, in as much as you've done it to the least of my brethren, you've done it unto me. So, try to 
incorporate the food. Now, if you want to have it separate, you know, there's some Bible studies that do this. It's a pretty set routine. You know, what they'll do is they'll have people come in and it's a meet and greet, you know. So they come in, you know, and they, hi, how are you? Let me take your coat, you know, let me put it in the bedroom, you know, and they put it in the bedroom, you know, or they, you know, yeah, Joe's over there, you know, go talk to Joe, and they go talk to Joe, and they visit, and they have all this kind of socializing things. Well, you know, they hadn't seen each other, and they want to talk, you know, blah, 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 you know, blah, blah, blah. you know, to me it's boring, but anyways, that's, you know, a nice thing for people that are socializing, you know, so they socialize. So then as everybody's getting there, and you wait, you know, and you're checking the clock, and you say, man, you know, we can only wait five more minutes. I, you know, I told everybody after 10 after, you know, we're going to go, so guess what, we're going. Set a time, set when you're going to begin, and then give a grace period. That's the way it works. Give a grace period. Then just start no matter what. It doesn't matter if they come in later. They'll know, you know. So you just go ahead and set that. Set time, grace period, start no matter what. Open with prayer if you want to. A lot of people do that. You know, it's kind of a format, you know, thing. You're kind of inviting the Holy Spirit in. It also gives everybody a chance to wind down. Don't make a long prayer. Don't preach in prayer. Don't teach in prayer. It's just prayer. You talking to God. God talking to you, let it go. Because what's the most important thing is you're sharing and teaching. So, that, that, remember this is the traditional way. So then you say a prayer, and then everybody, you know, is there and you say, you know, and usually some kind of leader's got to be a leader, so he's got to play the leadership role. So he's got to make eye contact and visit with the people, and they look at each one, you know, and say, Joe, you know, Mary, anybody new here? Oh, yeah, hey, what's your name? Oh, hi, how are you? Oh, yeah, you know what, you know, I, yeah, I've been there and done that. Yeah, nice hair. Oh, yeah, nice coat, nice tie, you know. Stupid techniques, I know, you know, kind of like, you know, it's boring, but people do it, you know, and you can recognize professional because that's what they do, you know, they always compliment something that's on the person, they always make sure they can find something to compliment them on because they've been to professional speaking school and they know that, that that's the way to make a personal contact so they interact that way. But you'll hear it and you'll see it, so don't be afraid to identify it and know it. I just thought I'd say it out there so that way for all those professional speakers, <laughs> hate that stuff. It's called salesmanship. So they do that, you know, and they're going to play that game and kind of do that thing. It's kind of like, you know, you just got to deal with it. You let the Holy Spirit do what he's going to do. So as you've made that contact, then you say, okay, does everybody have their materials? You know, okay, well then let's go ahead and start. And you've already prayed, you've already got it open, so then you open it up and then you begin to take your first book, you know, your little book, and then you just read the first page, you read it, and then you say, okay, who wants to repeat? You know, tell you what, who wants to go first instead of who wants to repeat? Did anybody memorize it like you're supposed to? You know, because it says memorize in the first week. So does anybody know this scripture? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. What's it say? And if somebody says it wrong, you just go, okay. And then you go on to the next one. You say, okay. You don't say good. You don't say bad. You just say, okay. And the next person says, good. You see, Proverbs 3, 5, 6. And make sure that the person quotes it exactly the way that it's in the book. Because you don't want paraphrasing yet. Because paraphrasing is going to get into all kinds of issues down the road. So you want exact interpretation. Because you're going to tear it apart in your explanation of it while you're talking about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. If that's the person you use. If you use assurance of salvation, it says, And this is the record, and that God has given to us eternal life, his life is in the Son. He who has Son hath life, he is not Son of God, hath not life. Now, most people are going to want you to teach on identifying, let's see, when they do assurance of salvation, and this is the record, yeah, okay, and they are doing 1 John 5, 11, and 12. They're going to want you to memorize the address, you know, and some people memorize the address, I don't. I'm very adamant about it. I don't want to memorize the address. I don't believe in addresses. I don't believe in that kind of stuff. But, you know, if other people do, good, do it. You know, go ahead and share it and let them do it and have them memorize it so they can find it later. In First John. So, going through it, when you're assurance of salvation, then you say, what is the record? In other words, start going through analyzing each part. And you say, what's the record? And everybody knows what the record is. Because what's going to happen is that as soon as you say, what is the record? People are going to say, it's the Bible. It's this. It's that. It's this thing. It's that thing. Don't go there. What you're doing is you're trying to get people to look at what they read. Only allow for the answers that are in the scripture you just read. And this is the record. What is the record? That God hath given to us eternal life. You see, the answer is the next line. That's called, um, you know, in the eventual teaching down the road, if you went to theology school, it would be called expositional teaching in the way of expository 
of the continuity of the contextual hermeneutic of the sentence structure within its own context. Now that you have that theological terminology, let's get back to the reality. It just means that it's there for a reason, and the answer is always in the context. So you could just say, in context, what's the answer? The answer is, and this is the record. This. What's this? That God has given to us eternal life. But there's an and there also. And then someone else will go, but what about and? You go, and the life is in his son. And you go, ah, so that's what the record is. The record is that God has given to us eternal life, and the life is in his son. So how many of you agree on that? We all agree? Cool. So let's just all agree that the life is in the son, and that this is the record, that God has given to us eternal life. And you move on. And you see how that works? I hope you see how that works, because that's the way that you would do that in a Bible study. And the same way you should do that in every study that you do, because otherwise you're going to get off on tangents. So then you would go into, he that hath the son hath life, he that hath not the son of God hath life. Because you always want to go in order. So if you were going in order, it says, what has God given us? So I just kind of pulled a fast one, because I'm not going in order when I read that other part, but now I'm going back to the beginning when I was in order. Because the first question was, what is the record? The next question is, what has God given us? Because if you notice, that's the second half of that sentence. God hath given to us eternal life. You see how the answer is there? What has God given us? God hath given us eternal life. Okay, where is this life found? And this life is in his son. Or where is this life? It's in his son. See, as you begin to take each part apart, and then use them in order, one, two, three, four, then you begin to ask the right questions so that the people are looking at the scripture so that they're not just magpieing it, but that they're actually thinking about it. And you want to make sure that each person that you look at, when you ask the question, you make eye contact and ask them, where is this son at? Because when you want someone else to answer a question, you go out of your way to point at them. You would say, for instance, if I was talking to this person over here, I'd say, and what is the record? The record is, yes, right, okay. What is the, you know, what do you think the record is? In other words, if that person was wrong, I'd say, well, what do you think the record is? And the other person would say, well, the record is that God has given to us eternal life. Yes, see, God hath given to us eternal life, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life. Because then you go back to the person and you reaffirm them. You look at the other person that just gave the answer and you thank them. Then as you want someone else to answer, you would look directly at them and you would say, God has given us what? What has God given us? So if you use your body language, as you use your hands, as you make eye contact, that other person knows you're asking them the question. <laughs> it's pretty obvious when I'm doing that to you right now, isn't it? Well, it would be pretty obvious to them over there if they knew that I was doing this right now. And I'm saying, what is the answer? I don't have to say Jane, Jerry, Joe, Don, Francis, Gary, or whoever. Because when you use a name, even though it's nice to make that personal contact, you can embarrass the person when they don't know the answer and they don't want to answer. But if I go, and what is the answer? You know, and then someone else goes, yes, you're right. You see how quickly you can cover the base of the person that won't answer? So you can always do that. These are all tips. They're not necessarily have-to-dos. This is just a general overview so that you can do as the Spirit of God inspires you to do. Now, for me, I was always considered the person that everyone wanted in their home Bible study because I would reinforce everyone's answer. Someone would say, well, eternal life, you know, it's like the Bible. And I say, yeah, the Bible says, and this is eternal life. He that hath the Son hath life. He who is not the Son of God hath not life. So it would be always reaffirming back to, pointing to exactly what we were studying at the time, which is what you always want to do. Bring it back to the point of why you're there. Always reinforcing the one scripture, the one that you're studying that way. Don't jump ahead, don't jump behind, don't go ahead, don't preview, don't promote, don't do anything. Keep it simple and direct. And you'll find that all these tips just make it more personal and more real. So as you have the food and you got the attention and you're going through that and you're discussing it, then you would get to the end where you'd say something like, you know, well, you know, now that since we're all together, does anybody have anything that they really want to share or they want, you know, like prayer for? I mean, 
since we are together, we could pray. I mean, does anybody feel uncomfortable about praying? You know, I know I feel very uncomfortable sometimes, you know. And if, you, if everybody doesn't mind, if you want to pray, we could pray for things, you know. And so that's how you cooperatively work together to do those spiritual things that are important to the manifestation of God in your presence. Now, music is a little tough because, you know, if you're not a singer, you ain't going to carry it. Because, frankly, this whole idea of playing off, you know, the sing-alongs, the karaoke things, you know, is kind of like you're going to take a 50-50 shot on that. Not everyone likes the music. Not everyone likes necessarily the same type of style of worship or music or praise or whatever it is that you may have. I could recommend some things and say that that works for everyone because they did. But rather than do that, I would say, as the Spirit of God leads you, let Him inspire you. I mean, if you got a you know a little CD and you want to play it, well, play it and listen, and everybody can go, mm -hmm, praise, Amen. You know, I mean, <laughs> or you've got, you're going to get somebody like me that's going to go, yeah, <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> but you know the point is that you know it's nice if you're a guitar player, you know, and you do know how to play. Really, not practicing. Please don't. You know, if you don't, if you're not professional, don't do it. Just make it the emphasis is on the word for your home Bible study. And then as you develop that, then, you know, once you go through the five scriptures, once you have this down, and we get done with this Bible studied intro to assurances or beginning with Christ, um, then I'll explain to you how to do a big Bible study, you know, how to you know really get kind of like a big Bible study that's going to expand into a church or something, you know, we'll get into that. But for now, try to take these tips, you know, try to take this as a Bible studied 101, the first one, and this is our beginning, you know, and we'll just call it that, Bible studied 101, B, I don't know what I called it, BS, <laughs> oh well, maybe it's not BS, I forget what the number is that I'm using for this tape, but use this tape, you know, to use those tips that I mentioned, then take time, really, if you're the leader, Take time to pray for each person, you know, whoever they may be. Pray over each person, say their name, you know, think about them, have them in your mindset, picture their their the way they look, and then talk to God about them, you know, and, and express to God what you want to see for them, you know, how you want them to either memorize the scripture or know it or something peculiar about it that you know individually is unique to that person. And you'll see that God will then begin to inspire you in ways that you didn't know that you were a teacher. You know, you'll become animated like me. <laughs> or you'll become calm, direct. Or you'll be, you know, just who you are with your own personality, you know, and God will use that because if you pray through, God will take you through. If you don't pray, God may say <laughs> he don't want you doing it, but you always need to give somehow some acknowledgement to the Lord by way of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. You have to acknowledge him in some ways in all that you're doing. Otherwise, he's not directing you to do it. So that is your way and venue of presenting information, relating, beginning with Christ, to those people that you want to start a home Bible study with. Now, this is obviously now a home Bible study, discipleship, or you want to call it like a follow-up after, you know, getting saved thing, because that's what I think it should be, is five weeks, you know, hit them hard, you know, so to speak. No, just five weeks of follow-up, you know, it should be the first thing they do after they get saved, you know. Sure, give them a New Testament, you know, give them a Bible, you know, don't give them just a New Testament of John, you know, it's stupid, you know, give them a Bible, you know, I mean, Bibles aren't expensive, you know, you can either give them a Bible and tell them only read, you know, New Testament, or give them a Bible and, you know, tell them, well, I don't know. To me, it's like, you know, that's just cheap not to give somebody a Bible. It's like cheapening God and it's like, you know, just eliminating that information, that inspiration would cause someone to want to, by way of their own curiosity, look through the Bible and examine it for themselves and flip through and try to, you know, play with it as they want to. Because... That's what a new person, any new believer, if they've never had a Bible, gets thrilled about. They hold a Bible. When you give them some throwaway, you know, some junky thing that's just a 
toss away, you know, that's just some piece of the Bible. You just make it like, you know, anything else that's junk mail. You're throwing it away, you know, and it's just, that person's going to feel it. They know. But the first time they get a Bible, man, they're thrilled, you know. And if you're going to give some cheap, junky, throwaway gospel to John, you know, at least do something like, you know, put in it where if they complete five scriptures, you're going to get them a Bible, you know, I mean. Or if they read the entire book of John, you know, you will buy them a Bible, you know, I mean. If you won't, I will, you know. I mean, I've done that, you know, I give them my Bible, you know, and then I go buy my own new Bible. <laughs> but the point is, is that don't cheapen the Word of God. Don't ever treat it like trash, you know. Don't ever make it less than what it is, which is eternal life that you're giving to someone and you're causing them to know Jesus in a personal way. So if you love what you're doing and sharing the gospel, then make sure you're willing to go the extra mile that you might have to sacrifice yourself and your money and your life even for the sake of one other person getting to know God in a personal and intimate way. Because that's what it is, discipleship, laying down your life for another person. And so this is what we would be doing, and this is how we're going to do it. So. We will do the first one, um, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and I'll try to maybe have an outline for it, like I started to do as I began to explain it to you. Um, maybe even have my wife demonstrate, maybe, I don't know. But we'll have it in Bible schooled, or Bible studied, yeah, Bible studied, Bible studied, maybe that should be called Bible schooled. Anyways, yeah, Bible studied, the next one, whatever the numbers are. And so this will be, you know, the new split. And this will be Bible schooled. So I think we're going to call one Bible studied and Bible schooled. That sounds better. Praise the Lord. Got that solved. God really kind of messed me up on that one because I didn't realize that this was like 13 weeks. 13 weeks? Boy, huh. man, that's a lot of tapes. And this one is five weeks. So there we go. We have it. Bible studied, Bible schooled. Praise the Lord. God bless you, and I pray that you'll continue on with this and that you'll use these to pass on as well as in your own personal development of learning how to disciple, how to study, how to share your faith, as well as how to share the Bible with someone else. Because this is kind of a little bit partly religion, but it's partly relationship, and it's partly interpersonal communication with you, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit working through you. So you get all three for the price of no price at all. Praise the Lord. God bless.